Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the April webinar uh, for our 2024 webinar series for Kirk. Uh, we will allow some time for people to join um, and get started in just a minute. Uh, as you see on the screen, um, go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat uh, with your name and organization. And um, we'll get started in just a minute. Thanks for joining everyone. Keep the intros coming. We'll just give one more minute. Um, people are still, still logging on um, and we'll get started soon. All right, uh, why don't we go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to today's presentation of the Kirk webinar series entitled Reduce First, Plastic Water Bottle Waste Avoidance Strategies. My name is Leanna Hauser. I am a Kirk board member and I'm also the sustainability manager for Zero Waste at Johns Hopkins University. Well, let me just go ahead and advance the slide. Um, I'll be your moderator today, and I'd like to thank Corey Berman, also a Kirk board member who is providing support on the back end. Um, and thank you all for joining today. If this is your first uh, webinar uh, and you are not familiar with Kirk, the College University Recycling Coalition. Oh, actually, we're not using that anymore. <laughs> it's just so used to saying it. If you've noticed, uh, our branding has changed. So we are now referring to ourselves as Kirk a community of zero waste champions in higher education. And Margaret's on the call and she was part of that branding. So my faux pas, sorry about that, Margaret. Um, so, um, but anyway, we uh, represent over 1000 sustainability champions in higher education from custodial grounds, recycling supervisors, student leaders, sustainability coordinators, managers, administrators. Um, but we are all here to support you, our fellow waste reduction and diversion champions at colleges and universities across North America to advance sustainable materials management in higher education and foster the exchange of best practices to achieve zero waste and build a circular economy. So today's program is part of our free Kirk webinar series, which is designed to highlight innovative campus programs and provide trends and perspectives on a broad range of operational and educational topics related to collegiate waste reduction, recycling, and sustainable materials management. Today's program is the second webinar in our 2024 series. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes to go over. If you have any problems with your audio or video, you can visit Zoom Support Center um, to avoid background noise. Uh, we are in webinar mode, so everyone's um, uh, no one can join uh, via audio. Um, but we encourage you to submit questions at any time using the Q&A section, not the chat box. 
um, and we will read as many of the pos these possible as possible out loud when we get to the panel, um, the panelists uh, Q and A portion at the end of their presentation. Um, if we are not able to get to your question live, our panelists can um, respond in writing. Um, and, but we welcome you to use the actual chat function for general comments or to chat with other attendees. Just keep your, your questions for the presenters in the Q&A box. Um, copies of today's presentation slides will be available to download and a recording will be available to stream within the next week or so um, from the Kirk website, which is www.kirk3r.org. So now on to our presentations. Um, in order to fully achieve zero waste in our, on our campuses, we must adopt the zero waste hierarchy framework, which shifts the priority to the reduction of waste rather than just diversion through recycling or composting. This webinar will share case studies at two schools that have successfully enacted strategies and policies that avoid waste from plastic water bottles. After listening to today's panelists, we hope you will gain insight into plastic water bottle ban policy development and implementation, as well as research to support water bottle filling stations and alternatives to single use water bottles. Today, we will hear from Emma Rosandich from the University of California, Irvine and Margaret Bounds from Connecticut College. First, we will hear from Emma. Emma is a fourth year undergraduate student at the University of California, Irvine majoring in urban studies and minoring in international studies. One of her key interests is sustainability and how to incorporate it into day-to-day -day life. She participated in the Campus as a Living Lab program through the Sustainability Resource Center last year, where she was an intern working on how to reduce plastic waste by collecting data on water bottle filling stations on campus. After she graduates, she plans to continue her journey in the world of sustainability and the environment. She also enjoys traveling, learning new languages and museums. So uh, welcome, Emma. We always love having students join us to present our work. So I will stop sharing and you can go ahead and share your screen and um, go ahead with your presentation. Perfect. Thank you so much, Leanna. All right. I'm going to go ahead and make sure this is visible. Perfect. Okay. Um, well, this is going to be my, well, first of all, hello, everyone. Um, this will be my presentation about the water bottle filling stations that are at the University of California, Irvine campus. Um, I'm going to first talk a little bit about the sustainability and how UCI defines it and the way that it's been developed um, over the years. Um, UCI is very proud to label itself as a sustainable university, um, and I did include some of the achievements um, at the bottom of the slide, um, naming how or seeing how Princeton Review of 2024 named UCI as the number nine uh, of number nine for being a green college, as well as according to the Sierra Magazine, it is number two in sustainability as of 2021. Um, and along with other things in terms of being considered the 10th for the green, greenest fleet um, for the electric buses um, and having multiple lead certified buildings. Um, given um, those statistics, we uh, UCI is constantly um, having different efforts um, for achieving sustainability. And with that said, um, it, been, uh, it connects to the water bottle station project. Um, and UCI has the motto of defining sustainability as enough for everyone forever. And the way that UCI has worked towards achieving this um, is identifying campus-wide goals that include understanding fundamental environmental, social, and economic issues, enhancing student learning experiences by integrating sustainability, and overall deepening um, that learning experience in relation to sustainability. And then just a little quick table of contents, what I'll be talking about. Um, first, I wanna discuss kind of the aims of the project um, as working as an intern with um, the facilities management, which is where I uh, conducted it through, then how we collected all the data, what we found with that data and the overall results in the end and kind of how we can move forward to 
um, continue as a campus, but also to share our results um, with other universities and other departments that can apply to this in their life because we want to increase sustainability in any situation. Well, first of all, um, the aim of our project um, were to understand how much plastic was being consumed through the usage of single-use plastic water bottles um, across campus with the water bottle filling stations um, that have been installed, installed over time. Uh, given the statistic that's included at the top of this slide, uh, you can see that it takes approximately 1.4 gallons of water um, in order to produce an average single use plastic water bottle. So it shows how unsustainable this production is, even though it's something that is some uh, something that we use day to day because we need to drink water. Um, and a note that this project has been in action for approximately 10 years. The first water bottle station was implemented or installed in 2013. Um, so long before I was a student there, so I'm ex I'm kind of just talking about my experience um, through this year of interning and data collection. Um, and I'm very happy to have been able to be a part of this great project um, on campus. Um, but yes, the overall key goal of what we were achieving um, was having making sure that there is fresh drinking water for all students and staff on UC at campus and gradually um, that's what this project is luckily been able to see. All right, and a little bit more about the water bottle stations um, themselves and how they've been installed at UCI. Um, as you can see in the images on the right side, um, we have um, these stations installed inside and outside of buildings um, and making sure they're accessible to all students, faculty, and other um, people that frequent the university. Um, whether that's also staff or else um, otherwise, and so on. And so some technical details that include that I'll talk about is the names of these stations, the brands that we've used at UCI, um, both Murdoch and LK. Um, key features that include um, that we've learned over time is how the fact that the, the filter is a key uh, necessity um, in order to know when the filter needs to be changed to ensure clean drinking water. Um, also, like I said, there are indoor and outdoor models um, that can kind of be applied to not only universities, but say companies or other uh, contexts. Um, on campus at UCI, now there can be found 226 um, water bottle stations. And that is not only including the main campus, which is where the lecture halls and all the buildings where students and staff frequent, but also um, housing and other locations that are not considered the main campus. And lastly, um, uh, as you can see in the images, there is also the signage that is included at our water wall stations in order to indicate um, that the, where the locations of them are. So students and um, faculty are able to um, access them and easily find them. And so that's also a key reach for our um, usage. Um, I'll go a little bit more into detail about some technical parts as I discuss the results in the next slides. So the second part I want to talk about is how we collected our data. Um, so I was working with another um, UCI student at the time um, to collect this data. And as you can see, there's this map that shows um, already existing water bottle filling stations. And we use that in addition to previous year's data to um, understand how many uh, water bottle filling stations we had and essentially what we did was manually collected the data um, from the each water bottle station on campus to know what the meter count was. So the meter count is a number that represents how many water bottles were filled at that station, at that specific station. And we use this number to see the growth over time. 
And specifically at UCI, we work on the quarter system. So we compare the number from the beginning um, to the end of the quarter, which is a 10 week period. And then we did the calculations to create an estimate for a year long period. And once we collected that data, um, we created a spreadsheet, you know, this is the more technical stuff of compiling all the numbers. Um, so we were able to convert um, the amount to see how many tons of plastic that was actually saved um, from the or from these in the installed stations. And um, like I said, we kind of compiled the um, the each quarter to create an overall estimate and uh, seeing how not every quarter might be the same and during the summer there's changes, but um, yeah, that was our key goal to see kind of the, just the data collection and the trends over the year. And something I want to also mention, I guess, as all of you may know, working with sustainability and working with different projects, that it's always a team effort and collaboration is really key. So in our case, it was many different actors that took place, um, including the housing and the student center that is on campus. Um, so that is just something to keep in mind of all the actors that take place in trying to make uh, our sustainable efforts come true. Okay, and moving on to the results of what we found with our data. Um, so it's exciting to say, well, I guess we can see it in the graph here, but it's exciting to see that over 3.5 million water bottle, or, um, over 3.5 million uh, single-use plastic waters were saved um, during this year of 2023. Um, and it shows really the growth um, from the start of the project in 2013. Um, in the graph, you can see the, the uh, blue, how it has, uh, was a, is a lot shorter than the orange and seeing that big uh, gap is a very exciting thing. And, um, the growth usage um, resulted actually also in more than a 30% drop in plastic bottle sales across campus, which is also something um, that we, um, as UCI, is a great accomplishment. And in addition, there's been kind of a cultural change that has resulted from this, where more, more and more students um, carry their reuse, reusable water bottles. Um, so hopefully we will just keep be, keep moving in that trend. Um, in the future as we you know keep adapting and adjusting the strategy or our implementation and and then some key takeaways for not only UCI as um as a staff working on sustainability but also to share this with other people that could consider or want to consider applying this um to their university and so on. Um, the first part is that we learned how location is key. We saw that there were areas of high traffic, had higher usage, um, logically, and therefore um, move forward to making, making sure that they were accessible to students in those areas. Um, and the uh, examples of um, high usage areas are located outside of bathrooms or inside lobbies, et cetera. Um, and another component that can be um, used um, in terms of considering this project is setting a campus standard um, over the course of the year. In addition to reflecting upon the previous years by comparing the data, we learned that the Murdoch brand was the best um, installation over time, um, given that it was the easiest to read and therefore collect data, um, which is one of the key components in order to be able to grow this um, project over time to keep making sure it um, is successful. We also learned that setting usage levels to compensate for those stations that do not have me meter counts um, is another strategy that was learned over time. So, so there are certain stations that do not have the meters on them, given that they were installed earlier on um, to, from different models. Um, but it's uh, we learned that even 
uh, by implementing the low, medium to high usage levels, we could kind of see a basis of, okay, in this area, um, this location, um, learning how maybe if it has higher usage, lower usage, and kind of going on from there. Um, and this influences obviously the calculation in the long term to see if it's necessary uh, to create uh, to install more in that space um, or if any changes need to be made in that regard. And lastly, in terms of campus standard, the convenience and the cost effectiveness is important to consider. Um, there, since there are different models, as I've mentioned, um, there are the ones that are installed with the drinking fountain, as well as the more uh, cost effective ones that are just like the spout of that, that are called goosenecks. Um, so that is something to consider in this project over the long term. We also found that proper signage is a key component for accessibility and awareness. Um, and as you can see, uh, we place uh, a banner signage um, over the water bottle station so students can learn more. Um, well, students can first of all access um, these stations and know where they are. Um, in addition to, we have stickers that um, have a QR code where you can learn more about the other locations on campus as well as more about sustainability as a whole. And then the last point is the high quality of the water that is in the water bottle stations. So making sure that that's taken into account. Um, again, going back to kind of um, those filters, those filters are key in ensuring um, having clean water for all. And I'm gonna be wrapping up with kind of what's next, kind of what the, if with these yield, results that we've yielded, kind of how we can move forward as a campus. Um, but first I wanna include a, a fun achievement that was actually recent when I got into contact with my um, previous supervisor is um, that we, after the, completing this project, um, we submitted a grant through the Green Initiative Fund, which is a sustainable organization on campus uh, that provided us the funding to be able to install two more water bottle stations. Um, so that is, Kind of just showing it's very exciting but also showing how um changes are always happening and there's always room for more improvements in that regard but in terms of what's next um and how we um you know the key is sh always sharing with others in is keeping the importance of keeping an annual count in order to track growth um continuing outreach and fundraising for example, at UCI, the current outreach is done through newsletters and our sustainability website, um, and also continuing to maintain our this well, this outreach and fundraising helps us maintain our um, zero waste pledge as well as the um, single use um, plastics, um, and it's been a key way to. Uh, that has allowed UCI to grow and advance in this area of sustainability as a whole. And well, yeah, that kind of wraps up um, what I've come to talk about today. Um, I thank you for your attention and I hope that this has been um, interesting and you know how it yields impactful results for the future. Thank you. Thanks so much, Emma. Um, we have a bunch of questions that came in, and uh, I'm just going to sort of acknowledge that you are an undergraduate student and you no longer work in the Office of Sustainability, so you, your knowledge of some of the answers might be a little bit limited. Um, but um, I thank you for for sharing, and it's a great presentation. And I and I again, like I said, I love having I love having students. Um, they uh, provide such wonderful support to our offices, uh, as you did with this project. Um, so I I did just want to point out, um, in addition to the um, uh, tracking of you know how frequently people are using um, the the. Um, the machines, and then that was used to to uh, provide um, some uh, a, a basis or a case for for the grant. Um, can you speak a little bit to um, the um, the the standards that you learned from um, the different machines? Like, for example, 
Did, do you know if there was any sort of like greater usage? Um, you said location wise is really important, but the types of filling like station, like the spouts, like the gooseneck versus the, the full bottle, like were there other things that, that your research um, found that helped the office determine new stations moving forward, either like where they go or, or um, the, the type of equipment or the brand that they use? That seems like is really valuable information. Yeah. Um, well, given the fact that the the only way that we were able to know the actual numbers was when we had those uh, water bottle stations that had the filter on them. So, for example, the gooseneck, unfortunately, you couldn't tell how many people were using them. So um, with that in mind, we would say we would take the area that it, the gooseneck um, water bottle station was um, and if it was um, close to one that did have a filter we would take that into account and kind of make the comparison or make the assumption in this case um, that it would be receiving a similar usage level um, however if it was not the case then we would um, assume what take into account um, whether it's a frequented area um, because on campus, I'm sure as many university uh, campuses are, there are um, buildings that have more classes than others versus some that are only for um, professors that um, have their offices in. So it's different. We kind of took that into account as best as we could, of course, um, since it can be difficult to know exactly, but we set our like the, the low to be 10, I mean, of all the numbers, uh, the lowest to be like 10,000 versus the highest to be, um, I think about 20, 25,000. So kind of taking uh, of the usage. Um, so um, moving kind of like there, um, it was again, kind of an estimate, but yes. So that interesting leads to the next question, which is uh, we had a number of questions about the filters and whether or not filters are really required or necessary. Um, do they um, help people feel more comfortable using the machines or are we sort of doing a disservice by saying that our tap water needs to be filtered and therefore if uh, we don't have them or if they're not maintained and that filter light is not on um, or it says it needs to be maintained, do people then, um, you know, not use the machines? Um, so I guess, you know, um, in terms of like maybe as a student and as someone who worked in the Office of Sustainability, do you, can you speak a little bit to um, to the, the 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 need for having the filter? I mean, besides the fact that you had said that it, you can't get the data if it doesn't have a filter, um, but from your perspective, do you feel like um, having a filter makes people feel more comfortable using the machine versus using bottled water? Um, I believe it could be an like a an additional or a, an additional factor that may influence students and staff to use the water bottle stations. From my experience, I mean, sometimes um, the light, it goes from red to green. Um, and sometimes the stations um, on campus um, would have like the flashing red light showing that the filter would need to be changed. Um, however, um, I would say that um, it's, it's not necessarily able to be chose to uh chosen like for the water bottle stations um once like a certain if a certain model is implemented it's going to have the filter light plus the meter count so it's kind of like a all-in-one package if um you're installing the same model over time since it was not the case at uci because the project kind of grew over time and they learned that um one state uh, this model was better than another model and it kind of grew over time and that's kind of the mistakes that were learned um, from. But I think as a student, um, the, as long as the water comes out cold, I think, which is nice. And I've learned that um, the reason that they have like the, they have a special like um, source that it comes from them to make sure that it's already filtered. So the filter light in this case also doesn't necessarily mean anything because, well, I guess as a, having worked at the state of the office, now I know that it is filtered. 
without even needing the filter. But I guess as a regular student, that does change. So maybe I'm a little biased, but. Got it, got it. Well, um, we ran out of time, but there are a number of questions in the Q&A that if while uh, Margaret is presenting, you could answer those. Um, you could type the answers in that way um, people can get a little bit more information. And um, and I'll just uh, mention also that um, maybe what we can also do is if you're able to uh, speak with the uh, staff in your office of sustainability, if they would be willing to um, provide their contact information in our follow-up email so that if people had any more questions regarding UCI's program, they could reach out to the staff person. Yeah, so unfortunately, I think um, there have been changes in staff and I'm not um, because I reached out to my uh, my old supervisor and she's not working with the university at all anymore. Um, so this I'm not maybe the best person to know who to reach out to at this point, moment in time, um, just given the fact that there's some staff changes happening, unfortunately. Okay. Well, we will uh, we'll do our best uh, yep. to get information to everybody in the follow up. But if you could answer any of the questions that you're able Absolutely. to answer in the Q and A, that would be wonderful. And um, thank you again. Um, and we will move on to the presentation by Margaret Bounds. Um, so um, Margaret has served as director of sustainability at Connecticut College since February of 2022, having previously served as assistant director of sustainability since January of 2017. From 2010 to 2016, she was coordinator of environmental sustainability for university housing at the University of South Carolina. She received a Bachelor of Arts degree in environmental policy from Barnard College and a Master of Science degree in international development and the environment from the University of East Anglia. She can often be found on campus pulling recyclables out of trash cans, as many of us can uh, attest to. Uh, so go ahead, take it away, Margaret. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Liana. And um, thanks, Emma. That was really um, great to, to see. I really love your signage. I want to steal some of that um, for our work as well. So um, hi, everyone. As Liana said, I work at Connecticut College. I'm the Director of Sustainability. Uh, just a little bit about us to sort of set the scene. We're a much smaller uh, school, obviously. Um, we're a small liberal arts college. We are located in uh, New London, Connecticut on the um, shoreline of Connecticut. We have around uh, 1900 students and the primarily um, residential campus for all of our undergraduates. Um, our Office of Sustainability was founded in 2013 and we have my, um, my staff position. And then we also have a faculty director of sustainability that um, helps co-direct our, um, our office. So I'm going to speak a little bit about our bottled water ban, how we got to the ban, and then where we've gone since then. Um, so we, um, in 2017-18, we wrote a new campus sustainability plan, and there were two sort of relevant recommendations in there. One was to have an annual sustainability theme each year, and then the other was to reduce our total waste by 20%. So we actually don't have a zero waste goal at the moment. Um, we've achieved our 20% waste reduction goal. Um, so we're sort of deciding where we're going to go next from that. Um, and our first campaign um, for the year was called Pla Pass on Plastic. I actually think I got that name idea from a Kirk webinar <laughs> uh, way back in the day. So um, we decided to focus sort of our events and education for that year on plastic. And as part of that campaign, we formed a group called the Bottled Water Task Force that was um, made up of students. And then the groups on campus that we felt like were the big users of bottled water. So dining, catering, admission, athletics, and student life. Um, the, they host the biggest events on campus and were the, um, the main purchasers at that time. The, um, the purpose of that task force was first and foremost to build support for reducing plastic um, bottles and water specifically, but we really wanted to make sure that before there was any kind of official ban, we were building support in, in all of the different departments so that people weren't surprised by the ban or caught off guard um, when it actually went into effect and to hear their um, opinions on what we could do um, to kind of reduce our, our bottled water use. 
And that group really helped identify where bottled water was already being provided on campus, what kind of events, what were the challenges to switching to another form of water? For example, if it was a large outdoor event, um, what were the things that we might need to have in place to actually make it feasible to get, get people water without bottles? Um, and then identify some solutions that we could implement um, in advance of an unofficial policy. So this group also ultimately drafted the policy that we adopted and um, sent it through our um, campus approval process, which um, is basically the President's Sustainability Council, which is made up of um, our college president and um, a group of senior administrators. So when they approve um, policies, we consider it approved for our entire campus. Um, the other thing that we did during this sort of um, year campaign was have students sitting in some of the dining spaces where we would be eliminating bottled water to talk to other students about um, how they could refill their reusable bottle on campus to sort of um, encourage them not to take the free bottled water that at that time was being offered at sort of a grab and go lunch location um, and kind of get, again, start spreading that word that we were trying to reduce bottled water use and take a little bit of the heat off of the dining staff because we knew that if complaints um, started coming in, they were gonna be those frontline workers um, if, you know, campus visitors and students saying like, where is, where did the bottled water go? So we wanted to kind of lay the groundwork with using students uh, to talk to other students. So, um, like I mentioned, we also did implement some of the solutions that we um, came up with in the task force before we adopted the official policy. We purchased an outdoor um, water station that we've named the Camel's Hump because we're um, the Camels is our mascot. Um, and we've actually bought a second one now. Um, both of them are, are look like what um, this picture shows. They have four um, taps that you can um, that you just sort of press with your reusable bottle. We also um, installed several um, additional water bottle filling stations. We we have primarily LK stations, and we also have some of the goosenecks um, that Emma mentioned um, in residence halls. And then the other thing that we did um, working with student engagement was purchased these um, water dispensers that hold the reusable five gallon um, jugs like you would put on a water cooler. And um, those are used for move in primarily, but also for other events like graduation and some outdoor um, outdoor events. And so you can see that in the picture, we set them up on tables outside the residence halls on move-in day. And that's actually something that our Office of Sustainability um, has taken ownership of. So we actually have our students on campus um, getting ready for like our orientation activities and they um, help set up those water stations. So we wanted to make sure we were supporting this change and not just putting the work back on the other offices that were being asked to implement um, the, the solutions. So our um, policy, we it was actually voted on in 2020, but um, I think we probably all remember that COVID was happening at that time. So that did put a, a little bit of a wrench in our initial planning um, because we were just doing so much more um, takeout dining. And obviously we had students isolating and it, um, we needed more bottled water around. So we delayed our policy um, until August 1st, 2021. And I just put the text of the policy up here for those of you who might wanna see the actual wording. The first three lines is the actual sort of policy. Um, and we did um, include single-use plastic straws in the policy as well. So now um, we have paper or um, compostable straws at our um, locations on campus. Um, and there's a few provisions that I didn't put on this screen, but um, we, we specified that the policy applied to still um, unflavored single-use water containers. So we were trying to also discourage the use of con cartons of water or cans of water because while they might be better, it's still sort of um, defeating the purpose of encouraging 
um, more people to just use the tap water in the filling stations. Um, and of course, there is an exception made for um, health and safety. If we had a citywide water shutoff or something like that, obviously we would need to purchase bottled water. Um, and then I did, I highlighted this last bullet point um, because one of the things that we also wrote into the policy was that we would look at the sale of other bottled beverages to try and eliminate plastic bottles because water is sort of the most obvious swap out because tap water is just more much more readily available. But um, we wanted to leave open the possibility of looking at soda and other kinds of um, bottled beverages in the future. And we have, um, I'll, well, I'll get more into that in, in just a minute. So when the policy was announced, we had an official email go from our campus communications office that they wrote and drafted. Um, I like sort of braced myself for, <laughs> for the angry responses and we didn't really get any, I think because we had planned for it for um, two years. Um, but we did put up these signs, um, where's the water and where can I fill my reusable bottle, um, both on all of the vending machines and in the dining location and bookstore where we used to sell bottled water. Um, that way, if, again, if folks were maybe angry or had questions about it, they understood that this was not necessarily coming from the staff people sitting right there at the checkout, but it was a, a wider campus initiative. Um, and we linked to the map of our um, bottle fillers. And then we've continued to use the sign um, that says bring your reusable cup because we want to remind folks that they can actually fill any kind of reusable cup. It doesn't have to be a water bottle um, at the dining hall drink station. So they can get water, soda, um, coffee, whatever in any kind of reusable cup um, from, from our dining halls. So again, um, like I said, we had this sort of official announcement. Um, currently, we um, we have a campus online purchasing platform that most people buy all of their you know office supplies and things through. There is a, a message that comes up in there that bottled water purchases are prohibited. Right now, we don't actually um, prevent anyone from buying bottled water through that system beyond the message, there is a way we could, you know, basically say like stop the, the purchase from going through. But um, that's something that we're considering for the future, though we're not seeing a lot of bottled water being purchased. Um, we also had been doing waste sorts of the student center and we um, have restarted those since COVID. And then last year, we actually had a group of students who are in the bottom picture who, um, led an initiative called Can Camels Can, and they were working on encouraging um, more swaps to aluminum. So figuring out what kind of beverages um, might be coming in aluminum cans and what could be um, what could be swapped in our retail dining. So did it work? <laughs> did it work? Um, we obviously um, are buying very little bottled water. Um, I found um, maybe like 48 bottles of water um, last year, purchased last year through our dining services. And I think most of that was for field trips. Um, we did change it from being an automatic um, bottle of water with the bag lunch program to being opt in. But um, some folks, you know, still might be going places where they would want to have um, bottled water with them. Um, and just a caveat, like all of the data I'm going to show next is plastic bottles, um, generally not water specific, um, again, because we're, we're basically uh, not purchasing any um, bottled water. So we do see um, a, a decrease in the amount of plastic that we find in our waste sorts of the student center, um, which I think is indicative of less plastic being sold in um, the dining snack shop. Um, and we see a little bit of an increase in aluminum at the same time, which is the main um, material now. Um, the other way sort of data, like don't look too closely at that because it's definitely not um, great news for our recycling rates. Um, but we didn't change anything else about our um, recycling communication or bins or anything at this time. So I think that that reduction in plastic is mainly 
from less plastic being on campus versus more just going into the recycling bins. Um, and this is just a picture of our most recent waste sort that we did with some first year students. Um, and then I also, in preparation for this webinar, I um, was curious whether we could actually see a decrease in plastic because um, we knew um, that through the Can Camels Can initiative, students have been encouraging dining to switch to more um, aluminum versus plastic um, for sodas and other kinds of beverages. So we do see over time a decrease in plastic being purchased and a, a really significant increase in aluminum purchases. So um, I did this analysis both by the percentage of the total um, like purchase dollars spent um, and then also by the number of containers because I was curious whether there would be a difference. Um, I expected that maybe glass beverages were more expensive. So, you know, the number of containers actually replaced by glass might be a little bit different. Um, so you can see the number, I mean, it's very similar um, trends, but um, if you look per, by the actual number of containers swapped, um, that's where you do see that more, a, a slightly more significant change in aluminum. And then, um, so our takeaways, definitely building support in advance of a mandatory policy. People definitely um, react to having things taken away from them. So I think really taking that time to um, explain why you're doing it made, made our transition a little bit smoother, um, including the dining staff who were going to be those like frontline people in the decision making was also really important. Um, and just sort of cultivating those partnerships across campus where you, you know, if you're, you're willing to kind of do some of that support work to put out the water stations or help purchase the outdoor um, water station, I think that that just sort of makes you a good partner. Um, and I did put this little picture up. I didn't mention these earlier, but we um, did put these little stickers up in all of our bathrooms um, just to remind folks that our tap water is safe. You can fill your bottle anywhere from any tap on campus. It doesn't have to be from a bottle filler. Um, and um, hopefully that, that made a little bit of a difference as well. But, um, and then this is just my contact information. I'm happy to um, answer some questions and uh, chat more. Thank you such, so much, Margaret. Um, we have a number of questions. Um, <clears throat> I guess, uh, so um, I'm gonna combine this question um, just sort of like specialty cases of like, did you run into any issues with sports teams traveling away without providing them water or visitors to campus who were not aware of um, that bottled water policy? Yeah, so we, our sports teams um, mostly travel with like one of those giant Gatorade um, dispensers. So we didn't get a lot of pushback from them. Um, and they also, I think they are still providing Gatorade, um, like bottled Gatorade. Um, and then they give all the athletes a reusable water bottle as well. So that was a dream. I haven't heard, <laughs> heard a lot of complaints from them. And I honestly don't think we've, had complaints from visitors you know we don't prevent like if you come onto campus with a bottle of water we're not gonna like slap it out of your hand um so students could bring you know water themselves or visitors but if you go in to buy water like it's just not there so i i don't think i don't think we've gotten a lot of complaints about it people probably just pick a sparkling seltzer water or some other kind of drink from from the dining shop, yeah. So you didn't make a switch from plastic water bottles to canned water bottles? No, can we didn't. Canned water, okay. Yeah, yeah. We just said no single use water, packaged oh. water basically, um, except for that like flavored seltzer. So I think we do sell aluminum canned, like bubbly um, or spin drift, those kinds of things. Got it. Um, what about, um, it, do you, either you or UCI, have um, football stadiums? And do the policies extend there 
Um, and can people bring reusable bottles into the stadium? So we do not have a football team. <laughs> so that is a uh, a big waste um, eliminator, I guess. We don't, we didn't have to face that question, but um, we, so we haven't had, had that challenge. Got it, got it. Um, what about the, um, do, does Connecticut College have um, pouring rights through like Pepsi or Coca-Cola in, um, or does UCI, well, UCI didn't have a ban. They were just sort of focusing on, on water bottle filling stations. But I think that there's a lot of, a lot of schools that have contracts with Pepsi or Coca-Cola um, run into some issues with uh, eliminating bottled water, or even if they're not selling it, a lot of times they'll give it away for free for um, events and, and sports teams. Yeah, I think this is another area where probably being a small um a small school really does make a difference. We we do use Pepsi for our like beverage dispensers in all of the dining halls, but in our retail dining shop, we were already selling beverages from Coke and Pepsi, so we have sort of like a Coke <laughs> display case and a Pepsi display case. Um so we basically just told um, the beverage distributors, you know, we don't want any more bottled water. And um, we also work, our bookstore is outsourced. So we worked with them as well. Um, they sell some beverages and they they no longer sell bottled water. Um, I think it took them a, a little bit longer to transition fully. Like maybe they were selling out their stock or something, but that was the last place that I saw it um, disappear, um, disappear from. And is disappeared from vending machines as well? Yes, no, uh, no more water bottled water in the vending machines either. Um, and I just lost my train of thought because I was going to say something. It's gone, but um, <laughs> well, yeah. So I think in the vending machines, it was mostly replaced with um, like a Gatorade option um, because we didn't want to add an additional soda. Um, but we haven't done a deep dive into whether people are drinking, you know, people are buying more soda than before. Um, Got it. Um, is there an exemption or anything in the policy um, around like, you know, um, if there's drinking advisory or anything like that, where, um, you know, there, you know, you, you are able to go back to supplying bottled water? Yes. Yeah, we um, sort of at the bottom of the policy and I can send any if someone wants to see sort of the full document, I can send it. But we have a list of um, acceptable uses of bottled water. One is if there's a, um, like a water shutoff or a boil water advisory. Um, the other is for, um, health and safety emergencies. So we have a, a campus water, like a music festival every year, and they do buy, um, a little bit of bottled water in case a student just gets really intoxicated or really overheated. And they just need it. Like, it's like, you just have to give them water immediately and you can't go find their reusable bottle. Um, so they went from buying like a couple pallets of bottled water to just buying like one little case because we have the outdoor water station for, for like the primary um, water use. But yeah, that was definitely written, written in there because there's, there probably are times where you just kind of need to have some and um, you kind of, I think you 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 kind of hinted at this a little bit, but how long did it take for all areas to stop selling? Was it you know over the course of a few years or it staggered? Was just a couple of months because we knew it was coming. For we the policy was officially adopted in May of 2020, and it didn't go into effect until August of 2021. So the bookstore dining and the vending contracts, like they all had a basically a year to prepare. So it was really a pretty quick um, transition. Excellent. And um, this question I'm going to share with either Margaret or Emma, if you want to speak to, um, you know, we're, we're still talking a little bit about COVID. Um, you know, were there any concerns post COVID with water bottle filling stations, you know, really directing people there, um, whether like, you know, just sort of, you know, um, not not a real um uh health risk but sort of perceived health risks oh to the top to tap water i'm to sorry using just... bottle filling stations as opposed to to sealed plastic water bottles yeah i mean we definitely hear that same concern that like i'm a mentioned that people want like filtered water even though the tap water is totally fine 
but we have um, done some water testing on campus and then shared the results. So like we, um, the Office of Sustainability just paid for the water testing in like five of the residence halls and we'll have those results at tables that we do. And we can, we've continued to do the tap water challenge if anyone is familiar with that, um, where students sort of do a blind taste test and see if they can figure out which is the tap water. And we bring the results to that. So I think that also kind of helps people see that like, maybe there isn't really that big difference um, or as big as they thought, but. Yeah. Emma, did you, do you know if there were any concerns about people, um, you know, bringing their water bottle, they're clearly, you know, touching and using and then bringing it up to a water bottle filling station? Was there any anecdotal or any concerns that came into your office? Well, I know at one point, especially in like the 2020, 2021 time, um, there were more um, purchases of plastic bottles, unfortunately, given the reason that, um, you know, germs and contamination, you didn't want to be um, at risk, I suppose, um, which is why I think it was also kind of a shift seeing uh, start seeing the data that we collected in 2023. It kind of um, did make a jump in that regard. And so unfortunately, I think it was slightly out of our hands given that it was a global issue so but I mean I, luckily it's seeing that it's back on trend to kind of make make an impact got it thank you so much um okay it looks like we are we're getting close to um our time before we um before we go away I just want to share some announcements thank I want to thank uh, Margaret and Emma uh, for their wonderful presentations. And um, as I mentioned, we will we'll send a follow-up email to everybody who participated today. It'll include the links to their slides. It'll include uh, the recording. And um, if we're able to answer, we've copied all the questions. And if we're able to get some answers to those questions, whether from Margaret or or maybe somebody at the UCI Office of Sustainability, we will, we will do our best to get you those answers. Um, um, but I also wanna share some announcements um, we have partnered with uh, Bush Systems. Um, and so hopefully you've seen in Kirk emails and many other um, of our sort of network, uh, you know, our network of, of, of allies around asking folks to uh, complete this survey of indoor waste and diversion practices. Um, so we encourage you to provide your institution's responses before the deadline on April 26th. Um, you can click on this QR code to take you directly there. Um, but, um, this uh, is going to really be helpful in providing a lot of, uh, you know, anecdotal and, and data for um, institutions that have switched to um, centralized waste stations and some other practices around indoor waste um, collection and diversion that um, I think a lot of us can use to make the case for um, for those kinds of programs in our institutions. So definitely encourage you to um, to take that um, survey. And then, as I mentioned, this is a part of our uh, year-long series of um, webinars. So we do have a number of webinars coming up through the rest of the year. Um, the one coming up in June will be re waste reduction and diversion at large scale events. So we might get some questions about water <laughs> at those um, athletic events and um, other, other big um, things happening on campus. In August, we will hear about integrating waste reduction and diversion into academics. And um, then in October, how to write a zero waste plan. And then in December, alternative framing of waste reduction and diversion. Um, and we are always looking for um, schools to share. Uh, so Corey, I don't know if you have it handy, if you'd be able to pop that link into the chat we have um, a form you can fill out if you'd be interested in presenting from your school for any of those upcoming webinars. Um, so we encourage you to submit a proposal um, at kirk3r.org. Uh, um, and um, otherwise, uh, we will chat with you on Recycle and um, hope to hear from you there. And we'll share the follow-up on today's webinar. I'd like to thank Margaret and Emma again for sharing the um, wonderful presentations from their institutions. And thanks to Corey as well for providing backup. 
And we hope to see you all in June at the next webinar. So thank you so much. Have a great day.